so uh, we're going to start looking and understanding more about spatial localization. We were handouts in the back doing that. Um, and uh, we use the next two lectures. We, we started looking at this a little bit last time. We were looking at MR signal equation. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll review some aspects of the MR signal equation for about 10 minutes at the very beginning. And then we're going to come back to that signal equation because it's so important. Um, but we're going to kind of take a step back from it, talk about the first aspects of spatial localization. Right? You guys have done a lot of work already to understand how we generate uh, state of transverse magnetization that contains contrast information how to manipulate that contrast information. And now the big question is, how do you get that contrast information out of the slice that you care about? So we'll talk about the first sort of aspect of that today, which we refer to as spatial localization. Specifically, we'll talk about slice-selective excitation, how it is that we excite a specific slice, and how we design our impulses to excite a specific slice. Um, the other thing that we'll do, we'll work a little bit on the board today, uh, probably for kind of 20, 30 minutes towards the end. Uh, I think maybe there's a few slides after that. We'll wrap up. Uh, I don't think we'll use the full two hours, but I say that more often than not. Right? Uh, and uh, I do have the second homework to get back to. Uh, overall, things look pretty good. Um, the one sort of comment from the TAs uh, was that no one's coming to office hours. Right? So if you guys feel rock solid, confident, and things are going fine, uh, then by looking at the homework, I would say things are in pretty good shape. Uh, but if you're, and I might reach out to a couple of you just to check in, right? Because I want everyone to succeed, I want everyone to do well. Um, and one of the easiest ways to sort of pick, the, pick up, you know, the pace or to get back to understanding some of the earlier materials to talk and visit in uh, So at any rate, uh, just uh, putting that out there. Uh, but the main reason I'm telling you that I have the homeworks is so you don't let me forget the end of lectures that I have. Is that cool? There's, there's a lot of uh, shared interests here. Okay, so uh, so this we've seen plenty of times, right? And so just a, just a reminder, what we were talking about last time was really how we go from transverse magnetization, and this was some of the recorded lecture material and some of what I reviewed last time, but how we, through a series of um, signal processing events, actually get to the MR signal equation, which tells us about sort of the magnitude and the phase of the signal at a particular point in phase space. <coughs> And we're still working on understanding and developing this concept of case space. We'll talk about it a little bit more today at the beginning of this lecture. So the whole challenge, of course, is that uh, having developed the contrast that's of interest, it's T1 weighted, it's T2 weighted, we use an inversion pulse, whatever. Uh, and in fact, you'll if you take a sort of a sequence, of course, that follows this in sequence, you'll learn about all these other ways of preparing the magnetization. Um, but the idea is you have some underlying object, in this case it's an axial head, and you can Compare the state of the transverse magnetization. Uh, it's going to vary over space. Every little voxel, every little pixel is different tissue, so it's going to have a slightly different response to the arc pulses that you play, for example. And we care about it at a specific time that we'll just, for reference, call time zero. That might be the echo time, for example. We want to figure out what's the state of the transverse magnetization at specifically the echo time. And what's not obvious, and we're going to have to take some more time to develop this concept, is through the application of gradients, after you prepared the magnetization, you can set up a wave inside of your magnetization that maps to a pattern something like this. How do we do that? Well, this uh, case space variable here depends on, depends on the gradient waveform that we apply. We saw an expression earlier uh, that the uh, k vector depends on the integral of the gradient wave. And that means the more gradient area you have, the farther and farther you are out of the k-space, or the bigger and bigger your k-vector. I'll take a second and, and show you in MATLAB sort of what these functions sort of maybe look like a little bit more carefully. But what you're, what you're doing in principle is preparing the state of the magnetization, and you're applying a gradient. That gradient creates another pattern in your magnetization, uh, and it's the superposition of the state of transverse magnetization plus, plus this, this, this applied pattern. And your receiver is saying, well, I'm going to pick up as much signal as I can. And the signal I'm picking up is just everything that I get from that excited slice that's been modulated by a particular spatial frequency pattern. And if that pattern is present a lot in my underlying object, then I'm going to get a large amplitude of that particular cable. If that pattern is completely absent from your underlying object, and the magnitude of your k points can be really, really small. And this is the, this is the you know, sort of comes out of the Fourier transform theorem that 
any object can be decomposed into a sum of you know, these kinds of patterns of appropriate amplitudes and appropriate frequencies. And it's really, I mean, a really sort of genius move uh, that, uh, that these guys could get this out in the first place. And so we remember that what this represents on the left hand side here is the signal at a position in K space. And so we're talking about just the individual pixels, some point in K space, right? And at the time, for some very, very short period of time, when we're listening to the signal coming out of our slice, and the signal that's coming out of our slice is just the transverse magnetization zipping past our coil, we receive that voltage signal, and, the, and the, basically the magnitude of that voltage signal depends on the state of the transverse magnetization and the presence or absence of this particular pattern. And this pattern we change you know, hundreds of times, so we sweep through sort of all possible patterns and figure out whether or not our object uh, figure out how to reconstruct ultimately an image of our underlying object. The reconstruction process we'll get into more detail uh, next week. Uh, and then at least what um, we've said many times, if you don't have a, an appreci appreciation for it yet, that's okay, we're getting there. Uh, but we've said many times that once you've acquired all of your underlying K data, then the Fourier transform will help you recover the image of the underlying object. Questions about sort of what's happening there? Just sort of, I don't get it, questions, or I buy it for now, but don't totally get it yet. That's okay. Okay, so the gradients are going to help us move around to different K points. By moving around to different K points, we're going to zip through K space in any way that we choose. There's better or worse ways to do so, but we can zip around through K space in all of our K points and then finally. Yeah, no, yeah, so you'll see an example of this. I think it's in the homework assignment that I owe you. I'm sure I know you're waiting for it to be posted. Um, but, but basically, yeah, the, this image itself is really uh, very, very closely related to just the sum of all of these patterns. But you have to know how much of each pattern to add. Is it a lot of that pattern or not very much of that pattern? What this case-based diagram tells you is that for low spatial frequencies, stuff that's in the middle, and a low spatial frequency is like a really slowly varying spatial frequency, but those tend to have high amplitudes. So you, you, you tend to have a lot of that particular pattern in your underlying object. Um, as you get out to other points in case space, obviously uh, the magnitude that's represented here depends on the actual object that you're imaging. But it's effectively by adding up the signals from all of these different with the appropriate amplitude, you will get back the image itself. And you'll, you'll actually see that. Uh, I forget if it's a summer or something. Yeah. Okay, so this is um, an example I like using for, to, to further sort of, uh, sort of get across this idea of case space and image space. And so on the left hand side is case space, and I'm just taking the 2D FOIA transform of case space and showing you the image on the right hand side. Uh, and there's a couple things here to notice. Uh, the first thing, and, and perhaps distracting, but really important, is this little dot, right? This little dot that's moving around was designed by me, right? And all I did was I said, for wherever that dot resides, go ahead and make that spatial frequency really, really high in amplitude. Over-represent that spatial frequency. Take the 2D FOIA transform and show me what the image looks like. And so what you see on the left-hand side is underneath it, there's this object, this heart that's beating around, but you also see this uh, banding pattern that's changing its spatial frequency, how how uh, close together or far apart those lines are, we refer to as spatial frequency, and it's also changing its orientation as a function of where this dot is. So as it gets out kind of high in case space, there's a, a pretty fine banding pattern, and then it's going to be spiraling back into the sort of middle of case space. You see changing orientation if you look in the image here now. And as it comes in, in the middle of case space, the banding pattern gets to be pretty broad, uh, and then almost disappears. When so this is just a visual example of what a point in case space uh, represents. And I think you know, a good thing to remember is that a point in case space tells you something about there's something that's happening over the entire field of view, right? It's not telling you about a point in image space. A point in case space corresponds to a pattern over your entire field of view. Uh, and so it, it takes you know, a little bit of intuition, and it takes a little bit of learning to, to really appreciate what individual points in case space would do to uh, as you become, if you become an MR scientist, 
uh, it becomes really important to be able to look at images and understand you know, what kinds of artifacts or what kinds of problems you're seeing in your images. Uh, and sometimes to understand what's happening there, we actually come back to the FOIA space. And so in this example, you might have a very unusual looking image, a banding pattern, you say, I don't get it, what happened? You come back and look at the FOIA space and you see this spike in the bones, okay? Let's try to figure out why that happened, but that's clearly the discrete thing that happened in the case space data. Yes? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time on this today. We're going to come back to this concept, but I think. It's a, it's, a difficult enough, it's a difficult enough one for this course that, it, that it's helpful to see it a couple times. So there's different ways of sort of thinking about what is case space. In, in one sense, case space is just the raw data collected by the scanner, right? We're measuring all this, reporting all this stuff to disk, and we have to do something with it to ultimately pull the image. Um, we've talked already about how a point in case space tells us about the presence or absence of a particular spatial frequency or that pattern in the underlying uh, acquired um, and when we acquire echoes using a gradient echo or a spin echo, each echo measures actually many of the spatial frequencies that comprise the object. The middle of the echo gets us towards the middle of case space, but all the other points in the echo that we record are um, happening while we're moving across case space. We have an actively turned on gradient. That gradient, because it's turned on and time varying, is going to be moving us through case space. So we'll, we'll develop this concept more, but while we're acquiring the echo, we have a gradient on, and we're actually moving through case space and sampling lots of different spatial frequencies. And that's what happens during the acquisition of a single echo. Um, you used to probably think about audio signals. Audio signals have units of hertz. We'll see, we'll, we'll work the FOIA transform some today. So if you're used to thinking about audio signals in terms of uh, frequency, there are FOIA transform pairs time, so time and frequency go together. K-space also has units, and it's something like inverse uh, space, one over centimeters, one over millimeters. Um, and we don't really think about things too much in that space. In fact, uh, it's something I've been thinking about trying to add more distinctly in this course. Uh, but just like in the object domain here, we have the concept of space. We can move millimeters up and down, or millimeters left and right. In K-space, every point represents a particular spatial frequency, or one over centimeters, how many cycles per centimeter. So just keep that in mind. Um, you've heard this said several times, and we're going to keep developing this concept, but gradients help us extract these different spatial frequencies uh, by moving us through K-space and helping us ultimately sort of composite the K-space data we need so that we can uh, take a FOIA transform and become the underlying object. And in general, a line, a single line of K-space is filled by a single echo. Uh, we haven't talked about multiple echo uh, techniques very much. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, but you could, in principle, uh, excite once and acquire several echoes. You could excite, refocus, form an echo, refocus, form an echo, refocus, form an echo. That would be one example. In the gradient echo review that I just did, we also talked about multi-echo approach for getting, uh, for helping you separate out that from that. Um, just one more uh, example, and I'll show you just a little bit of some MATLAB snippets uh, that will help you with uh, one of the upcoming um, this is again just drawing out the point that different points in case space represent different spatial frequency patterns. So this is a spatial frequency pattern, kind of intermediate spatial frequency at an angle, uh, and as that K point moves to be sort of just oriented exactly along the Y axis, then the orientation of that spatial frequency pattern is changed as well. Uh, and if we move out, say, along the diagonal, you can see that we go from an intermediate spatial frequency pattern to a higher spatial frequency pattern. And we'll talk more about what different points in case space represent, uh, but it's good to, to recognize that the middle of case space basically tells us about um, uh, the total amount of magnetization. Right? We haven't turned on any gradients for, for the purposes of spatial encoding. We've excited the system and we're just listening to all of the magnetization in that whole slice. And so for the, for the very specific uh, point at the middle of case space, it's telling us actually something about the total amount of magnetization. Um, this is the spatial frequency weighting term, right? It's an exponential of e to the minus i, 2 pi, some k vector dotted with some position vector. And I want to show you sort of more concretely what that actually looks like if we look at some uh, MATLAB code. And so all I'm doing here is saying, okay, we have to define gamma or gamma bar. Uh, gamma bar has units of hertz per gauss. 
Uh, I'll pick a gradient strength. This is just one example in units of gauss per centimeter. Then I'll pick some time step that I care about. In this case, seconds. So this would tell me this is one millisecond when we're using this one time step. I can then define my k vectors. My k vectors are just gamma bar times the gradient strength times the duration that I've been applying that gradient. This really just tells you about the gradient. Uh, the gx times dt is just the gradient area, right? So the, the, the bigger that area, the higher your k component, your kx or your k y. And so, uh, like I said, we, uh, in acquiring actual images, we'll have to have a time varying gradient and we'll be moving across space and we'll actually reduce the interval form. This is just the discrete form. That's the answer to times its duration. Um, the next thing that's done here is just using what's called the MD grid command, no big deal. All it does is define some positions for us. And here I'm using units of centimeters, so I assume that the spatial positions I'm defining here are also units of centimeters. And so I have a, an X vector that goes from one centimeter in 0.01 centimeter steps to plus one centimeter, and I have a Y vector that does the same. What that MD grid vector does is it says, I know how many points you want along X, I know how many points you want along Y, I'll make a grid of points that span that X, Y vector, if you will. And so this gives me a grid spanning, you know, minus one to one, and minus one to one along uh, X and Y. And then this is just the Poiseuille sampling function that we were talking about uh, in the previous slide. And so it's just the exponential of, uh, it's e to the minus I times two pi times my K vector, K dot R. And here I have kx times my x position, and ky times my y position. And I map this out across all x and all y uh, for the specific kx and ky that I here. And so these are the actual FOIA sampling functions. This is what the MR instrument is doing behind the scenes. It's uh, using the right, you know, it's using the gradient that you prescribe for a duration that you define uh, to set up a spatial frequency sampling function of the underlying and then this is just some volume that's using. So does this, does this, do you understand how this function maps back to uh, the Poiseuille sampling functions that we were talking about that show up in this MR single equation? And so these are just plots of those functions, right? We could look at, um, we could look at the real component of it, we could look at the imaginary component of it, or we could look at its magnitude and we could look at its phase. And it's really kind of in the phase image that you see with this what this free, uh, what the sampling patterns really looks like. So again, we're, uh, what, what those FOIA sampling functions do is we use gradient waveforms to multiply our magnetization by a particular pattern, and then the receiver picks up the signal of the object multiplied by that pattern and tells us whether or not that pattern is especially present or absent in the underlying object. And we record that as a value for a point in K space and move on. So this will be, uh, this rather will be helpful to you. Uh, in Questions about what this for means mathematically or what I did? So on the next one, let's take a real image of the early measure, are they all kind of accurate views? Yeah, it's a little hard to tell, right? But if you look at the corners, the corners yeah. all. Some, some. Okay. Okay. So that's that's kind of what I have to say about the MR signal equation for today. Kind of a, a little bit of a refresher, a little bit of a reminder of where we were with that from last time. Um, and again, like I said, we'll we'll come back to this concept of spatial frequency encoding a little bit today, uh, uh, which is the sort of the rest of this lecture. Uh, and then when we come back on uh, Tuesday, uh, uh, there'll uh, be another lecture about. Signal. <laughs> okay, so when it comes to spatial localization, it's something called spatial encoding. The, the problem, what's the problem? The problem is that uh, you maybe use an RF pulse or something to, or, or you understand how to use a sequence of RF pulses to manipulate the, the state of the transverse magnetization. The problem is how do you get that, how do you get the information back out of the region that you care about, right? Why wouldn't we just have excited the, the whole body? Uh, we don't necessarily want to do that. We want to get data from a particular slice and then back uh, a particular slice with a particular orientation. And so if you're interested in getting information 
uh, out of a three-dimensional body, uh, then you probably have to go through at least three spatial encoding steps, right? And the spatial encoding steps that are very typical for almost all of conventional MR are the following. You have to go through a process of slice selection, and that's mostly what we're going to talk about today. And that just means you have to pick a slice, right? You have to decide, are you going to image this slice, this axial slice through the head, or are you going to get some W oblique slice through the chest or some other slice through the knee? Uh, seems reasonable enough. Once you've excited a slice, that's not quite enough to get the two-dimensional information out of uh, the magnetization that's in that particular slice. And so, as it regards getting information out of that single slice, we have to go through a process of what we call phase encoding and frequency encoding. And these will get further developed in the Tuesday lecture. Uh, phase encoding basically says you have to encode at least one of the two dimensions within that slice. And then frequency encoding, also, also called the, uh, the readout uh, part of the acquisition, uh, you obviously have to encode the other dimension within the slice. And you've seen some aspects of this already, and we'll just develop uh, at least the slice selection for today. Slice selection requires two things. You have to have an RF pulse and simultaneously you have to play a gradient. And we'll dig into this a little bit more today. We won't talk about today at least about phase and frequency. But that's, uh, that's and so when it comes to slice selection, I said this a little bit already, but we'll do just a little bit more detail. We have to pick an RF pulse, RF pulse or the B1 pulse, and it has to contain frequencies that are matched to the slice of interest, right? Uh, and, and we'll talk about what that means in a second. We also have to turn on a slice selection gradient, and that's generally just going to be a constant magnitude. The idea is if I turn on a Z gradient, for example, I can have higher frequencies in my head, lower frequencies in my feet, and now have a distribution of larger frequency through my body, and I can now choose an RF pulse whose center frequency is matched to this slice, or matched to this slice, or matched to this slice. That's the basic principle of slice selection. Uh, and we usually do that with just a constant magnitude. Just turn on uh, and so that's components sort of one and two shown here are simultaneously in RF pulse in combination with the gradient waveform. Uh, the last thing, and we'll develop this at the very end of the lecture, is what's called the slice select rephasing gradient. Uh, it's very it's a it's a very useful thing to turn on this gradient at the very end after you've done your slice selection. Uh, what's not obvious, but will become a little bit more obvious, is that that actually helps uh, significantly increase uh, the signal to noise uh, for the acquisition. Of the reason for that is this process of excitation, events sort of one and two together, will cause a, a through plane dephasing, so that through the thickness of your slice, or slice have a finite thickness, maybe it's a few millimeters, maybe it's 10 millimeters, but through the thickness of your slice, your spin will be pointing in different directions as a consequence of this, this part of the slice selection process. And what happens to our signal and spins are pointing in different directions? Goes down. Why? What do we call that process or that phenomenon? Yeah, dephasing. Yeah, intravoxel dephasing. Right. You've got spins pointing in different directions. Uh, it does happen because, in some sense, there's uh, off resonance coming from the gradient in this case. And so we can rephase the spins within that. We know it's going to happen. We can rephase the spins within that slice uh, using what we call a slice refocusing gradient, or a slice selection refocusing gradient. And that's this third little bit. Here. And so this is actually, you know, it may look like, oh, why do I need to bother doing that? But we'll show mathematically where it sort of comes up from, uh, what, where it comes from. And I'll show you uh, a simulation so you can see more clearly why that's a really useful thing. Does that do something similar, uh, like in our homework, where we play the uh, refocusing pulse, then flip it, then signal it up again? Uh, it's similar to that in that this will give you, you know, one phase distribution, and this will undo that phase distribution. There's a positive and a negative, uh, but the uh, but the action is through gradient rather than okay. So this I think we've seen uh, probably enough already. We have an RF pulse tuned to the frequencies of interest. We're not worried about phase encoding or frequency encoding. Uh, the, the first part, the sort of top, the positive part of the slice selection gradient is going to create a range of frequencies right from head to toe, uh, and then the second gradient, the slice select rephasing gradient, is going to rephase the spins. Uh, increase the overall signal to noise. Um, what's going to pop up in the next slide? Uh, yeah, the next slide is this pulse sequence diagram, and we're going to see it. We're going to animate it. We're going to. You'll just see a little bouncing ball following along from left to right. On the right hand side, what you're going to see is is two things. You're going to see um, a layer of a layer of spins. So imagine I'm just getting an axial slice through me, but it has a finite thickness. 
and I'm uh, using the block equation in the simulator to show you what happens to a, a, a family of spins that are within my slice, right? And so what you're going to see is spins that are actually outside the slice are basically unaffected by the combination of the RF pulse and the gradient, but spins that are inside my slice will slowly wobble around and fall down to be excited, uh, in this case, by about 90 degrees. The other thing that you'll see is um, we'll be looking down the barrel of the spins, so looking through the slice, and you'll see all of those spins stacked up on each other, and you'll see that they fall out of phase with one another at the end of this RF pulse and gradient. And so that gives you the sense that we probably need something to undo that phase accrual. Uh, and in fact, you'll see the action of this gradient unwind all of the spins so that they now point in the same direction. And so here we're sweeping along, and not much happens at first, right? This is through the slice. The slice we want to excite is about here. The spins are kind of wobbling around until finally they start tripping down into the transverse plane. And then on the far right-hand side here, we're looking down the barrel of these spins, and you can see that they're falling out of phase with one another. And that's intravoxyl dephasing is detrimental to the signal. What happens at the, it's going to play over again. So some spins are not really going to do much of anything. They're outside the slice. The spins that are inside the slice are going to do this kind of funny wobbling around until they largely tip over. And looking down the barrel here, you'll see the intra-slice dephasing, and now it's being rephased by that rephasing until they line up almost perfectly again. One more time. Pay attention to how much dephasing there is. This is through the thickness of the slice. And then as soon as this rephasing gradient comes on, the RF pulse is over, and this rephasing gradient here will pull those spins back into alignment. And I'll show you, that, uh, you know, sort of towards the end of this class, we know how much dephasing is going to happen as a consequence of the RF pulse and the gradient. So we can design this to restore uh, the through plane uh, phase that's within the slice. Uh, is this a 90 degree operator? Yeah, it's, it's a roughly 90 degrees. So why is there still a uh, good direction after, just after the Yeah, let me see if I can. Yeah, so like why are these spins still up? Yeah. And these spins are also still up? Yeah. So I, I probably could have sort of changed the drawing to be a little bit more clear. But some of my spins are in the slice, and some of my spins are outside of the slice. Okay? So what does that mean, right? How does a spin get to be in the slice or get to be outside of the slice, right? What you'll see today is that the design of this envelope function, this RF pulse, will give us frequency selectivity. Right? So there's, a, there's an RF bandwidth to this RF pulse. It has a center frequency. It has to match the slice we care about. But it also has a, a discrete range of frequencies that are part of that RF pulse as well. And so these spins down here are too far off resonant. Right? There's a gradient that's been turned on, and they have a substantially higher frequency, or these have maybe a substantially lower frequency, and they're outside the bandwidth of the RF pulse. That help, and so the what I what I'm showing you here is the idea that a well-designed RF pulse in combination with the gradient will select a slice, and just a slice of spin. It's not perfect. I'll show you. We'll talk some about the imperfections of this process as well. Uh, but in, in principle, we can we can uh, excite just a slice of spin. Yep. Good question. <laughs> Okay, so let's uh, dig a little bit more to slice selective uh, excitation. So we're just worried about how we excite a slice, right? Uh, what factors actually control the slice selection? Well, one of the first ones is the B1 envelope function, right? We talked about this much earlier when we were talking about the B1 subsystem. That envelope function has a few parameters that are really important to us. Um, operationally, our systems have a maximum B1, so we can only operate up to that maximum B1. There's different reasons why there's where there's a maximum in place, uh, it's usually related to uh, a substantially 
higher maximum won't actually improve sequence performance in any real way. And uh, a B1 max that's much higher will just help you heat up patients more easily. So they kind of design these things up to a near optimum of sorts. Um, the other two things, so, so today at least, we'll assume that the B1, there just isn't a maximum. That your system has a maximum. It's, we could use it if we want to, but we can't pass it. The other two things uh, that we'll, the two concepts that we'll develop, one is the bandwidth of the RF pulse. So I said it a second ago, the RF pulse itself has a center frequency, and then it has a range of frequencies about that center frequency that are contained in the envelope function of the RF pulse. The, RF, uh, the frequency of the RF pulse is not a singular frequency for almost all RF pulses. There's some range of frequencies. And that range of frequencies we refer to as the, as the bandwidth. And in MR, you'll hear, two, you'll hear the term bandwidth used two different times. One is in, in, uh, in relation to the RF pulses that we use for excitation. And the other is in relation to the readout gradients that we use. So keep those separate. There's an excitation component of bandwidth, the RF bandwidth, and then there's also a receiver bandwidth when we're measuring and recording that data itself. Um, you saw this on an earlier homework assignment and way back when we had the B1 lecture, but the B1 envelope function also controls the flip bandwidth, right? So when we integrate the B1 envelope function, we know how far we're tipping our, our magnetization over. Um, we know that there's some excitation carrier frequency, and we'll talk about how we pick our carrier frequency in just a second. And then the other design consideration is something about the gradient amplitude. So we got to try to figure out how to, how to pin down these different pre-parameters if we're going to design uh, a slice-selected excitation. Um, so this one, just a quick review. We saw this before. Maybe your envelope function is just a rect pulse, right? You turn the R off on, you wait for some period of time, and you turn the R off off. In this case, it may in fact be you know, almost a single frequency, right? You're just trying to excite something close to a very single uh, frequency. And then the flip angle, alpha, was just gamma times the integral of that D1 envelope function. And so you saw this, I didn't put it back in here, but you saw this as a design problem. You could specify the flip angle. That's usually the case for us. We know we want a 10 degree flip angle or a 180 degree focusing pulse. Uh, perhaps we're gonna try to use the V1 max if we can. And then the only free variable at that time is we typically want the shortest duration pulse. And so then we're just solving that expression to figure out what is our flip angle or uh, algebraically manipulated so we can solve for uh, its duration. So. Uh, okay. So when it comes to the slice uh, selective excitation, obviously we can turn on different gradients and consequently excite different slices. And so if we turn on an X gradient, uh, then we'll, you know, we'll get a slice that's, um, uh, who's, the, the, the slice that we can excite has a normal whose uh, direction is the X axis. If we turn on a Y gradient, then the slice has a normal, that's the Y, the y direction. And if we turn on a Z gradient, then the normal for the slice is the Z direction. Uh, it stands the reason I should have put a slide in, but we can turn on linear combinations too, right, of X and Y. And if we do so, turning on X and Y and Z, then we can start rotating the slice around and exciting either what we call oblique slices or even doubly oblique slices. So arbitrary orientations within, within the body are easily possible. Um, this just tells us, uh, back from the gradient lecture, what's the field effect of the gradients, right? What, we don't really care about gradients per se, we care about what's the effect of the gradients on the field at a particular spatial position. So, the B field coming from the gradient always points along the Z direction, the B field does. And in the case of an X gradient, it's a function of X, and it just depends on what's the GX amplitude. We pick this, right? Uh, its units are something like Gauss per centimeter. So Gauss per centimeter times position tells us about the field at a particular position. And that's true, similarly true for the X gradient, the Y gradient, or the Z gradient. So just a reminder of how the uh, B fields arise from applied gradients. Um, here we're just adding up together, right? So uh, the total applied gradient field, if we want to talk about the B field from the gradients, always pointing along Z, it's just the superposition or the sum of whatever we're doing on the X and the Y and the Z gradients. So compactly we can just write that as a dot product. The gradient vector that we turn on or off in whatever position it is that we actually care about. Um, and then when we have to uh, jam, the, and we'll do this in just a little bit, when 
to jam these things into uh, the block equations and the equation of motion, then we have to take into consideration the total B field, which is just going to be the B0 field plus the gradient field. And the gradient field is some gradient. It could be time varying, gradient field that's dotted with some spatial position. So just a little bit of known picture. Um, so we should recognize this already, right? Gradients produce a spatial distribution of frequencies. And so uh, this is what the spatial distribution of the, of the field looks like. We have G0 plus the gradient dotted with position. So as we look along uh, uh, the Z position, we have an increasing uh, magnetic field strength. And we could, for example, turn on a gradient of, struct of twice the strength, and then consequently, at that same distance, have a field effect that's twice as high. And how much gradient you want to use, uh, I mean, there's, there's some limits here, right, from having no gradient turned on to sort of the maximum gradient strength. How much gradient strength you need depends on exactly what you're trying to do. We'll see what effect that has on, for example, slice selection in just a second. Um, obviously, it stands to reason you've seen this probably, a, or you're familiar with the concept a lot by now, that then the frequency now becomes a function of position as well. And so we can turn on, uh, we always have our B0 field, we can turn on a gradient as a function of position, we can map out uh, different frequencies as functions of position. And this becomes really important for uh, a handful of things, but obviously gradients create a distribution that should be of the larger frequency as a function of space. Uh, and this becomes really important for uh, spatial localization, which is this concept that we're doing. Okay, so let's, um, let's think about how we actually uh, put together different parts of the RF pulse. Uh, we have to determine some of these free parameters. So, I said a little while ago, we have to figure out the center frequency, we have to figure out the bandwidth, we have to figure out the gradient strength, and we have to figure out the pulse envelope function. Pulse envelope function is actually the trickiest bit, so we'll probably do that sort of after the break. Uh, you know, we'll work on this for 20 minutes, take a break, and then come back to that part. Uh, but that's sort of maybe the, the crux of this particular lecture. Okay, so how do we pick the, uh, the omega RF? That's the, the carrier frequency for the RF pulse. It's pretty straightforward. We have our B0, so that's our fundamental sort of baseline frequency, if you will. And now we're applying a gradient, GZ dotted with Z. And you will, as a user, for example, have someone lying in the scanner, and you know what slice you want to acquire, usually just by almost drawing a line uh, on some image that you've already obtained of the, of the subject or object that you're imaging. And so then it's pretty straightforward. The Z position that you're interested in imaging, we just use the one-dimensional example, the Z position of the thing that you're trying to image maps back to a frequency that depends on the applied gradient that you're using, right? And so, given an applied gradient waveform, uh, or applied gradient strength, and given a position Z, that will all by itself tell you what your center frequency for your RF pulse needs to be. Now, as users, obviously, we don't have to sit there and tune the center frequency of the RF pulse. What we're picking is just the Z position. Where do we want the slice to occur in the body, and then simple algebraic uh, equation tells us behind the scenes what RF to use. So what's um, you know, a simple example, right? If we're at isocenter, what's our omega RF going to be equal to? Yeah, omega naught or gamma B naught, right? And, so, and then you can, of course, go down frequency or you can go up frequency depending on uh, which slice you're trying to use. The other thing we have to figure out is, um, is what's the bandwidth of What's the frequency content of the RF pulse that we're going to use? And the reason that, that's, that that matters is, in the in the previous example, we just talked about sort of like the center location of the slice. Now we actually care about something closer to the slice thickness, right? We're going to play uh, a, a radio frequency pulse with a particular center frequency. That's going to tell us that where the center of the slice is located. But how much magnetization we actually excite is going to depend on what we call the excitation bandwidth. And the excitation bandwidth that you need or that you want just depends on gamma times GZ times the slice thickness. Delta Z is the slice thickness that you care about. And so going back to this mapping of frequency and spatial position, if you wanted to excite a really, in this case, really thick slab through this individual, your delta Z in this case is maybe 20 centimeters, not well chosen, but uh, it maps out here well. And that's going to tell you, given an applied gradient waveform, what's the range of frequencies that have to be in your RF pulse, okay? And so, uh, as an example here, we can talk about what happens if we use a stronger gradient, right? 
So in using a stronger, let's say I kept my RF, I kept my delta RF the same, my the bandwidth of my RF pulse, I kept it the same, but I turned on an even steeper gradient waveform, right? What happens is that I end up exciting not just a, a slice in a different spatial position, but of a different thickness as well. So that, that steeper gradient waveform gives me a, a bigger uh, range of frequencies from head to toe. And a bigger range of frequencies from head to toe means that that same delta, that same bandwidth that I was using actually uh, accords with a thinner slice. And so there's limits here, right? Uh, we have quite a bit of flexibility over the, um, the bandwidth of the RF pulse. It, 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 there's, there, there are ways we'll talk about this, and there's ways to pick or design the, the bandwidth of your RF pulse. Um, one of the limits that we'll bump up against, though, uh, will be gradient strength, right? The maximum gradient strength that we can achieve, right? So um, if you can't go um, sort of stronger and stronger with your gradients, what does that mean about your slice thickness? Can you get really thin slices? No, right? So if you wanted to excite you know, a slice that was a half a millimeter thick, you'd have to have an extremely uh, strong gradient subsystem. And that's typically not available to excite such thin slices. And so for most of MR imaging, um, the, the minimum uh, slice thickness that you can typically excite are on the order of about two millimeters. Sometimes you can get just a hair below that. Uh, but you start running out of, uh, in fact, B1 power and gradient strength. It's easy to excite a big, thick slab. It's hard to excite a really big, thick slice. Is the other way to do it is if you make your bandwidth uh, really small? Yeah, sure. Then you're taking one down. Uh, well, so, so we haven't talked about it too much yet. Uh, it probably stands to reason, though, that the thinner and thinner your slice, the less signal you have. And so that's another thing you fight against, right? You might, you might want a one millimeter slice for some reason, but your chances of having meaningful or useful signal from that slice is, is diminishing, right? Uh, but no, you're absolutely right. If you want to, you can, uh, you can change the, the, uh, the bandwidth of your RF pulse and consequently excite a thicker or a thinner slice. In the scenes, we usually keep our RF pulses are pretty fixed, and what we what we really change the most is the center frequency, so we can sweep the slice sort of back and forth in different spatial positions of a uniform thickness, um, and then we can change the gradient amplitude uh, to change the slice thickness. Our pulses are themselves relative. Uh, so we probably covered this uh, just in me talking about it, but let's go ahead and, and talk through it anyway. Uh, so how do we move the slice along the z direction? Let's let's say you know you you as a user you've decided to pick a particular slice and then you say no no actually I need a different slice. What's the system going to do behind the scenes? What are the options at least? There's two things I can control in slice selection, right? My R pulse and my gradient. So if I want to change my slice, let's say this is going up field to higher and higher and higher frequencies, what do I what do I do if I want to excite a slice that's more superior? Yeah. So is that up or down? Up, right? For the example I gave, it was up, right? And so you just you know behind the scenes, you're drawing well not behind the scenes, you're picking a different line where you want to excite, and then behind the scenes, the computer's like, okay, fine, I have to tune up my R frequency. So that I can slide the slice to be, say, higher into the volume. What's another option? Yeah, so you can also change the gradient, right? As I change the slope of this gradient waveform, I'll be shifting where the where the slice is actually uh, being excited, right? So for a fixed RF pulse, by changing my gradient waveform, I can move to different positions uh, through the body. But what what's changing simultaneously? slice thickness, right? And that's kind of inconvenient, right? So we generally want to avoid that, right? Um, the things that we that you usually care about uh, as a user is slice thickness and slice position, right? And so if those are the things you care about, those are the things you sort of prescribe, define on the scanner, then behind the scenes the calculations are being made about what should your center frequency be and what should your gradient strength be so you can cite the slice that you have. The other thing I'll say about this is that the MR systems are, are heavily designed for optimal imaging at isocenter. And so in this example here, we've got the pelvis at isocenter, and so consequently the head is going to be 
50, 60, you know, 90 centimeters away from the ISO center. We wouldn't actually do this experiment. What we would do is move the person's head to the ISO center as close as we can at least, and then uh, image that person to be precise. Um, once an anatomical location sort of moved to ISO center, you have some flexibility of sort of picking slices without moving the patient around. But for most MR exams, the patient will sort of move a little bit during the exam so that the, the, the slice of interest is close to the ISO center. Um, so the so we talked about picking the bandwidth a little bit. We talked about picking the gradient strength. We talked about picking the center frequency. But there's still this whole mystery of the of the B1 envelope function. And this is a there's some really ingenious sort of steps here to, to help us understand this. The envelope function at health itself determines what we call the slice profile. So we saw in that in that block equation simulation a little while ago that the spins were wobbling around and sort of falling down. Some spins at the top were not excited, the spins in the slice were excited, and the spins outside the slice at the bottom were also not excited. And what governs uh, you know, sort of how much or in what way something is excited heavily depends on the B1 envelope function. And we refer to it as determining what we call the slice profile. Ideally, for the slice that you care about, it has some finite thickness. Ideally, you would be manipulating all spins in the same way. You would have every single spin doing exactly a 90 inside the slice you care about, and outside of that slice, nothing would happen. Well, it turns out that's an extremely difficult thing to do in short periods of time. You need infinitely long arms to do that. It's not a practical thing. And so we need, a, we, need a, a, we need a different approach, right? We need an approach to figuring out how do we figure out this B1 envelope function such that we get an acceptable slice profile. We may not get perfectly, you know, 90 degree excitation of all spins, but if we get really close, then our slice profile is imperfect, but maybe it's good enough. But in fact, it's oftentimes good enough. Um, so you can ask yourself the question, what's the ideal slice profile? Well, the ideal slice profile would be a rect function, right? You would have uniform excitation through that slice and absolutely no excitation, you know, below the slice or above the slice. Turns out, like I said, that's uh, very, challenging and basically not, not possible. Um, changing the shape of that envelope function uh, um, uh, affects uh, what we call the excitation bandwidth. And so we'll talk in several ways about sort of how to design this B1 envelope function. And the question is, well, what, what, um, how do we know which shape to use? Like, how would you even begin to say, oh, I should use a sync-like function or maybe some other function? Uh, and the way we get at that is through what's called the small tip angle. And what you'll see, and it's really kind of a, a remarkable um, uh, outcome of, uh, of the block equation, to so the equation of motion at least, uh, well, no, block equations, um, is that the slice profile itself will depend on the Fourier transform of that shape function, of that U1 envelope function. And that's not an intuitive concept, it's not an obvious thing, but it's a really remarkable thing because we know a lot about Fourier, the Fourier transform. And so if we know what slice profile we want, uh, then we can take its Fourier transform and figure out what the, the B1 envelope function is supposed to look like uh, through the inverse Fourier transform. And so what you'll see through the development of this small tip angle approximation idea is that the sync pulse, for example, is a, is a great uh, RF pulse shape to use, RF envelope function to use, because its Fourier transform is really, really close to a rect function. It's not a perfect rect function, but it's pretty close. And so we'll get excitation that uh, is pretty close to what we want. Outside of the slice, we won't have much in the way of an XY of generation. Magnetization still points along the Z. Inside of the slice, we'll largely get our magnetization to tip over. And then outside the slice on the other side, it's relatively unaffected. So this gives us slice selective excitation. If you look across the slice from left to right, this is across like the thickness of the slice, you'll see that it's got some ripples and some walls. And we refer to that as the slice profile. The slice profile is imperfect. The perfect slice profile would be a perfect rect function. That's hard to, to get. Uh, to simulate. Okay, so um, what's coming up next then is the derivation that will take us through the small tip angle approximation. Uh, why don't we go ahead and take kind of a five minute break? Uh, get a break, take a break, uh, and then we'll come back and look through this. Okay? Thank you. 
So uh, right back at it. And so uh, what we're going to get into in just a second here is what's called the small tip angle approximation. And I said this at the very, very, very beginning of the lecture, and then we were just talking about it a second ago. Uh, the goal here is to, is to try to get some traction on how you possibly define that V1 envelope function. Um, it's critical to, uh, to getting the right slice profile that you want and being able to do so in a, in a time efficient way, right? Not having an RF pulse that's minimal. One of our pulses to be short for lots of reasons, but mostly for overall sequence efficiency. And so the small tip angle approximation, will, uh, we'll, I'll show you what the approximations are. We'll work through some mathematics. And what we'll see is that that V1 envelope function uh, can be thoughtfully designed through the Fourier transform. And that's something we know quite a bit about, whether it's whether you know it, hopefully you know something about the Fourier transform already. We'll, we'll touch on some of it uh, in this lecture as well. And so here's the here's the setup, right? Uh, what we what we have here is forced precession with a gradient, right? So this this starts to sound like a headache already, right? So uh, we want to look at the, the block equations uh, in the context of using uh, an applied gradient, right? And then forced precession tells us what, but we're also using what's forcing? What's that? An R pulse, right? And so that's and that sounds like slice selection, right? We need an RF pulse, we need a gradient at the same time. So how? So what happens to our system of equations when we try to do this? So uh, you remember the uh, in the absence of relaxation, the equation of motion in the in which frame is this? In the rotating frame, right? You got these rotating frame uh, locations uh, right in front of you. Uh, and so the, the the big deal there is you can figure out what's your V effective. What's the effective V field in the rotating? frame? We design systems, build them in the laboratory frame, but we have to transform things into the rotating frame so we can take advantage of a mathematical framework that's a little bit more straightforward. And so our B effective, we'll see, ends up becoming a function of both space and time. Why is it a function of space and time? Well, uh, our B1 component that we turn on is, uh, is a function of time. We have some envelope function, if you will. And in this case, I'm assuming it only acts along that I direction. Right? I could I could spill it out onto components uh, along the i and j direction if I wanted to, and that would just further complicate things. So let's assume we have an RF pulse that just acts along the rotating frame's i direction. So there's no v1 along the j direction. And then what's the uh, v effective that we have on the on the z direction? Well, we always have our v0 field. Our v0 field is offset by this what we call this fictitious field. Right? This is this magic of going from the laboratory to the rotating. So we basically always have this V0 and this omega RF by gamma term. And then we have to stuff in whatever whatever other um, component we have along the K direction. And in this case, we have uh, an applied gradient field. Uh, we'll say the GZ gradient. So the field effect of a GZ gradient is GZ dotted with Z. And now that means V effective depends on Z. We don't have the same V effective as a function of time. So we don't have the same V effective as a function of space, and that is going to complicate things a little bit. Uh, we take our V effective, we put it into our equation of motion, um, and we're going to we'll do this in just a second. We'll look at what the determinants 
uh, give us in terms of a system of equations, but we just have an I component to our B effective, right? This B0 and this fictitious field here cancel each other out, and so we really just have this, which up here, cancel those two terms out, and I just have a gamma B1 coming into here, I don't have any J uh, field, and my Z field is, or my K field is just gamma GZ value uh, Z. Uh, this term here, uh, uh, just to shorthand things a little bit, we'll write as omega one. Omega one is just the frequency uh, coming from the B1 uh, applied field. And then uh, on the bottom right hand corner here, we'll refer to this as, as an omega that depends on Z. So there's some spatially dependent frequency uh, term as well. Why are those frequencies? They just look like sort of longer equation terms. Okay, so that's the that's the setup for the problem. We're going to kind of start from this point when I get to, uh, over to the board. Is that a good setup? Yeah. Um, okay. So then, what's the small tip angle approximation all about? Well, we make this really what sounds kind of absurd assumption. Actually, we say, well, what if our m z component is approximately m naught, no matter what we do? Okay. That seems strange. We're talking about trying to force the magnetization. That's what V1 pulses do. We're talking about force precession with gradients. That's what slice selection is after all. But what if we make the assumption that our, the Z component, don't worry about X and Y, but what if the Z component of our magnetization is approximately M0, no matter what we do, it's just a constant. That sounds really strange, because I'm telling you about RF pulses that force the magnetization over. The MZ component's clearly going all the way down to something like zero. But in the, uh, in the sort of limit of small tip angles, five degree pulses, one degree pulses, and you'll see it actually works pretty well for even 30 degree or 45 degree pulses, which is where it starts to be a little more mind blowing. But we make the assumption that our MZ component's approximately equal to M0 during the application of a B1 pulse and an applied gradient. Okay? Not an obvious thing to do, but it ends up being a mathematical uh, trick that really helps a lot. Okay? So that should feel a little uncomfortable, but you'll see that mathematically it ends up being useful. Uh, okay, you guys had this in your the slide just a second ago, but I'll use it as my starting point. So we have uh, DMX, the, the vector, the time rates of change of my pulse magnetization, and that's equal to this big determinant. So it's like I hat, J hat, A hat, and keeping track of my MX component, Y component, Z component. And then the applied um, fields that I cared about, we said we could shorthand as omega 1, which is a function of time. That was the, the frequency coming from the applied B1 field, if you will. We said, let's assume that there's nothing happening. J direction. And then we have another uh, frequency dependence that comes out of the applied gradient waveform, and that depends on a function of space. Uh, the frequency of precession depends on space because we have an applied uh, gradient term. And so we, we have a sense of where this is headed. We're going to look at taking the, um, the different cross products to give us a system of equations that we can uh, then examine. And so the first thing is to look at our D term, and that just comes out of the cross product uh, here, the, uh, the J and K columns, if you will, and we just end up with uh, omega Z one. Uh, the next one I have to do is figure out what's happening to so D, M, Y, D, T. Uh, and DMY DT, uh, only slightly more complicated. I've got uh, a minus 
omega z times x uh, plus an omega 1 of z uh, times m z. And then the last one to work out is what's happening to d m z dt. Uh, and that's going to be uh, just equal to minus omega uh, 1 And the, the problem is the same problem I've had several times before, right? I've got a couple system of, in this case, ordinary differential equations. But that's a headache, right? Uh, you can see that the mx term depends on my, the my term depends on x and z, the z term depends on y. That's a little bit of a mess, but this is where the small tip end works. Help us out in just a second. Okay, so the setup is good. Yep. And then we carried on the conductors, right? The inductors. I did so. Um, we don't carry them down. We don't need to carry them down at this point. Um, this this does this is the the equation for what's happening on the i direction. This is the equation for what's happening on the j direction. This is the equation for what's happening. Uh, okay, so we're going to combine something, I'm going to roll this up a little bit, and what we're going to do is just combine the x and y terms together. Um, and so, uh, oops. Um, recall, for example, uh, that we can write the mxy magnetization, just the total transverse magnetization, as mx plus i and y. That's just using complex notation to, to couple together or add together the x and y components. And we haven't done this exactly uh, in this class yet, but that lets us uh, uh, add together those two uh, equations for the mx and my components of the magnetization. And so we can write this as dmxy dt. And it's literally just a complex sum of the equations that I had before. And so you'll get something like omega z plus i, imaginary i, times minus omega z on x, plus omega 1 of t times z. Um, we can add together those sort of independent x and y uh, terms together. Just write it as minus i times omega of z times m x y. So rather than sort of component form, we just write it as the transverse magnetization of the x and the y components of the magnetization. Uh, plus, we still have the z magnetization lying around. So it looks like uh, plus i times 1 t. So that's just a way of coupling together the, the two components of the transverse magnetization. And we still have this problem, right? The problem is that we've got, in this case, the transverse magnetization depends on uh, the first term, which is the transverse magnetization, plus some MZ component to the magnetization. Uh, and what we do here is invoke the small tip angle approximation to say that, um, that this term here is really just M. And again, that's a, that seems like a funny thing to do. We're talking about tipping the magnetization over. It must be the case that mz is changing, but certainly we'll limit a very small tip angle, one degrees and five degree tip angles, this makes sense. Uh, it turns out to be even, in, in practice, an even better assumption uh, than that. Um, and then let's talk about what's happening to the mz component. Uh, and so we also have our d, m, z, dt, Expression, and that was equal to minus omega 1 uh, of t times m y. Uh, but the small tip angle approximation told us that uh, we can't really change our the z component of our magnetization. And so it's time derivative, consequently, it's going to be zero. Uh, 
And so both of these assumptions here, these are the assumptions of the small tipping approximation. Okay. Yep. Does that lead to the last part of your search? Um, so at this point here, we've taken the MY component component and written them together as a single MXY component. And then we still carry down the Z component, let it be equal to M naught. And and that sort of so what's the, the sort of magic here, that's obviously an assumption. We're gonna figure out if it's a good assumption or not, but it's an assumption. Uh, the important thing about this does is it decouples those two differential equations. Right? So there's no longer an MZ dependence for your transverse magnetization. It's somehow magically just bound to the original amount of or uh, the original amount of uh, Z magnetization that you have. And then uh, because we said that we can't change the MZ magnetization, then it's, then it's derivative has to be zero. We can't change it as a function of time anyway. And so we say that it's, it's zero. Okay. Um, so what we, what we really care about at this point is just the solutions to this experiment. Expression here, and I'm not going to. Oops, I'm not going to work through the actual uh, solution itself, but I'll give you a form of the solution to that particular uh, differential equation. And so the solution takes on this form. Uh, we have m x y as a function of say space and time. This is the solution. Uh, it's going to be equal to i. Minus i omega as a function of z times time times the integral from zero to time, however long we uh, observe it, times omega one of tau e to the minus i omega z times tau times time. And that's not necessarily obvious. Uh, you can work it out for yourself, but that is a solution to that transverse magnetization uh, differential equation. So what we want to do then is try to figure out what does this tell us? What, what it should be telling us is uh, if we, uh, so what's the state of our transverse magnetization? Uh, it's going to vary over z, it's going to vary over time. There's some constant term in the front here. Uh, this constant term in the front here, imagine we're turning on an RF pulse, turning on a gradient for a fixed amount of time. Uh, it's going to, this term here is going to give us a frequency dependence, right? So there's a frequency dependence as a function of space uh, for our transverse magnetization. That frequency dependence is happening through Z, and Z is the gradient that we turned on. So this is a frequency dependence through the slice, right? If you have frequency times time, that gives you a phase. And so this gives this term right here gives us a phase that depends on space through the slice. And we'll come back to this term a little bit later. It's basically uh, uh, mathematically representing that phase distribution that we talk about having through the slice. And so at the end of applying just an RF pulse in combination with a gradient, you'll have this through slice phase dispersion. We have to deal with that because that was going to give us signal loss. But we know what it looks like, and so we know pretty well how to undo it as well. What shows up on the right hand side here is two things. You have Omega 1, omega 1 just comes out of your B1 envelope function. Uh, and so this is really just the Fourier transform, this e to the minus i omega z tau business, is the Fourier transform of 
omega-1, and omega-1 is your V1 envelope function. It's related to your V1 envelope function. And so uh, we'll develop this just a little bit more, uh, but we know that omega-1 is equal to the same. Okay, so it's not it's not critical that you know sort of like where the solution came from, right? I, I've said it a couple times. It's not a class about differential equations uh, and their solutions, but we have to we have to at least use their solution. So accept at least that that's a solution to that differential equation. And what's interesting about it is it points out, as I was saying, uh, it gives you some traction for if you uh, know what um, slice profile you want. So this information over here is actually going to be related to your slice profile. because it tells you about the state of the transverse magnetization through the z-direction, right? What, what its dependence is through the z-direction. And for the gradient that we've chosen, that's the slice left gradient in the z-direction. So the slice profile depends on uh, what's that phase through that slice, and then also the Fourier transform of ultimately the V1 envelope function itself. And so now if we want a particular slice profile, we can try to design the V1 envelope function to give us that slice profile. And we know enough about uh, Fourier transform pairs and we have an expectation about uh, why a Gauss V1 um, envelope function might be useful, a Gaussian function might be useful, or a sync function, or a rect function, these kinds of things. We'll, we'll look at an example, but uh, that's the direction that we're headed. So, um, we can make a, a couple of assumptions about the RF pulse that we might use. So let's go ahead and assume, for example, um, you typically have symmetric RF pulses. Time symmetric. Um, it typically will have some peak, say V1, um, at uh, what I call time to zero, the middle of the RF pulse. Uh, and then it has some duration, uh, and we call that duration uh, just tau RF. And so uh, just as an example of what an RF pulse could look like, Shape's not specific here, this is just saying a shape for the arc. Um, what we'll do is uh, if, uh, it'll turn out to be a little bit easier if we uh, uh, make a, a one substitution. So we'll go ahead and define what we call tau prime as being equal to uh, tau, which is the integration variable, variable itself, minus half of the RF pulse duration. And that just lets us center the RF pulse at time zero. Negative time doesn't make sense mathematically, it doesn't really make sense um, when you're in the laboratory, um, so to speak. Um, but that will, this will effectively shift right, um, the RF pulse uh, middle the peak to Okay, so all we're trying to uh, uh, do now is, is apply the, uh, this sort of substitution for uh, tau prime, and we get a new expression for our mxy. Uh, so this is the slice profile. It depends on uh, slice uh, position, uh, the position within the slice, z. And then we're going to care about what's the slice profile at the end of the RF pulse. So not just kind of any point in time, but specifically when we're done uh, applying the RF 
the business in the front still looks the same, so it's still i times m naught d to the minus i over z. Uh, but here we have a specific time, which is tau r f by two. And now what's a little bit different is the limits on our integral are from the beginning of the RF pulse, which is tau r f minus tau, tau r f by two plus tau r f by two. And it's omega one uh, times t plus tau r f by two d e to the minus i And so again, we recognize, uh, hopefully, that this term here really is just the Fourier transform. And that gives us some design leverage, if you will. And so we could write this, um, uh, again, just on the business in front, it's just uh, I am not e to the minus i omega z times tau r f by 2. And this is the 1D Fourier transform of omega 1 times tau, t plus tau r f by 2. So just writing it explicitly as the, um, as the Fourier transform. And then you can go one more step, which is to recognize that omega 1 depends on b1 um, through something like the Larmor expression. And so we write this finally just as i and not e to the minus i is omega z times tau r f. And so this is in front times the 1d Fourier transform of gamma e1 So again, this here was uh, Brun uh, slice dephasing. Uh, and this here is just the, the Fourier transform of the B1. And so again, what we're what we're interested in is what is if given uh, given an applied gradient and given an applied B1 pulse, what is our slice profile? We'd like to have a specific slice profile, a rect, for example, or something close. Uh, this gives us uh, a relatively neat uh, relationship between uh, the Fourier transform of the B1 envelope function and the slice profile. It really falls out of that small tip angle approximation that lets us break apart the coupling and the differential equations. And then maybe not knowing, but accepting that the solution to that differential equation now is this thing, which is in fact the Fourier transform of the B1 function itself. So perhaps not obvious, but it is there uh, in the past, so to speak. So um, probably what's useful to do then is to actually look at a specific example. So how, does, how do we actually use this, right? And so let's look at a specific B1 envelope function, or a specific B1 pulse. And so um, we, well, we use this example. Let's say, well, what if our B1 t is equal to some B1? I won't write it as the max just to save having written it, but this is basically something like the max. That's one design criteria, at least. Uh, so it's some amplitude B1 multiplied by, and rect functions are a little awkward to deal with mathematically, but we'll say, what if we want to use a rect function, uh, meaning the B1 envelope function turns on and then turns off, right, just discreetly. It's not a sink, it's not a Gaussian, it's nothing else. And so we write that as this box, this rect 
is time minus tau r f by two, we just centered the r pulse. And so what that pulse looks like, we sort of just set it So this is time, this is v1. And I've turned uh, some v1 pulse on for some period of time. And so we take this as time. Zero, the duration of the R pulse is tau F, and it has some amplitude in the R. Okay, so if that's our uh, if that's our V1 function, then we're, what we're thinking about is what's the Fourier transform of the rect function. And if you've taken signals and systems or Fourier transforms uh, before, then you can anticipate what the result's going to look like. Uh, so we come back to saying the slice profile x, y, uh, varies over space, if we want to know about the end of the bar, pulse tau r f, that's equal to a bunch of constants that are in the front, uh, i, m, not v e to the minus i, omega, z, tau r f, r, 2, times the Fourier transform, this is the one we Fourier transform, um, uh, the uh, V1 envelope function that we have, and what that function actually is now is gamma times V1 uh, rect of T minus, uh, sorry, T over tau R. Um, this stuff here, this is just a constant, so it can come out in front. Seems a little bit simpler. But what we have is just the 1D Fourier transform of this box function and this rect function, right? And so uh, the result uh, just ends up being, uh, if you know your Fourier transforms, is just uh, I and not E to the minus I omega Z times tau R F by 2. That's all the business in front. We can bring out uh, the gamma V1. Gamma is a constant, of course, V1 is just the amplitude of the RF pulse. Um, and this is multiplied times the sinc function. The Fourier transform of the rect function is a sinc. And so we recover a sinc whose input variables depend on uh, the duration of the RF pulse and some frequency variable. The Fourier transform pair variable for time is frequency. And so we have this uh, time variable inside the Fourier transform. That a frequency variable. Uh, the question is, what is the frequency that we actually care about in this case? And that's just related to the applied gradient that we were using in the first place. So it's a minus gamma over 2 pi times uh, the applied gradient strain times z. So the, the, the Fourier transform pair here depends on the applied gradient strain. Um, and so uh, we could write that all just one more time. So we have I m not e to the minus uh, oops, I omega z times tau r f by two uh, times gamma times e one uh, times the sinc function uh, that depends on the duration of the r. So this first term, we've said it a couple times, I'll say it once more. This is the, the through-plane dephasing. And this second term that's on the, uh, on the end here, this is the effective slice profile. 
So what does it mean? It means that if you chose to use uh, a V1 envelope function that was erect, we work through this, we take the Fourier transform of that V1 envelope function, it's Fourier transform as a sink. That means if you use a rect function, what you'll actually be exciting is something that looks like a sink. And so um, through the thickness of a slice, let's say this is the z direction, this is minus z and this is plus z, um, I will have excited, not very ideally, something I'll have a slice profile that looks something like that. Perhaps my target slice thickness was really just something like this. This is the delta z that I actually wanted to excite. I'll have a pretty mediocre slice profile. My mxy has a sink-like dependence on it. And I'll have some wiggles outside my slice on above the slice and below the slice. But it begins to give you some traction for how you would possibly design that v1 envelope function. Now, it turns out there's other and sometimes even more natural choices to the V1 envelope function which you might choose. So we chose a rect function because we know what the, what the FOIA transform of the rect function is. Um, but we could have done something different. What if our V1 envelope function, instead of being a rect function, was actually a sink? Right. And so if we could use a V1 pulse that was a sink, right, uh, meaning that all the way up here, instead of a rect, we have a sink. And after taking the Fourier transform, the Fourier transform, we just saw its inverse, the Fourier transform is, of a sink is a rect. And a rect would actually be a really nice uh, slice profile, right? So that rather than having this, uh, this business that I'm showing you here, we could potentially just have something much more uniform uh, inside it, right? And so we prefer a slice profile that looks more like that. Consequently, the logical extension is to say, oh, we should use a sync function. What's the downside to using a sync function? You have to apply it for a long time? Yeah, a long time, right? And so, in principle, a sync function goes forever, and forever is a long time, right? And so, you, in principle, have to truncate that sync function. If you truncate that sync function, meaning rather than having, you know, thousands of periods or thousands of oscillations in your sync function, you just go to a couple or a few, you can do that. You have a truncated sync function. And the Fourier transform of a truncated sync function is no longer a rect. It's a rect with a bunch of wiggles. And that means that your slice profile now has a bunch of wiggles. It has wiggles inside of the slice profile, and it has wiggles outside of the slice profile. So what's our goal? Our goal is we would like to excite transverse magnetizations in a uniformly in a slice. But it turns out that's almost impossible to do. You need an infinitely long sync pulse to do that. And as you start backing off of being able to use things that are very, very long in duration, you consequently have to use truncated shapes. And those truncated shapes will have some artifacts associated with them, either ripples inside the slice or even excitation that's outside of your slice, out of slice excitation. And that's kind of a funny thing, right? You meant to excite this slice, but you're getting a little bit of information, maybe even 10% of your information is coming from spins above or below your slice. You start getting these weird mixing effects. Uh, and diagnostically, that could be a bad thing, right? You can start representing anatomical information in your slice that you didn't want to, simply because you excited stuff that was outside. So it's, it's complicated, and, and we won't, I'll, I'll go back to the slides now in just a second, um, but the how, and specifically how to design those V1 envelope functions is, is tricky. A small tip angle approximation gives you a little bit of insight that says, oh, okay, there's a Fourier transform relationship between the V1 envelope function that I use and the slice profile that I get. The forward problem is I want a particular slice profile, what V1 envelope function should I use? And that, that inverse problem is actually uh, also very difficult. If you take 229, uh, you'll learn a fair bit about how to, how to solve that problem. Okay? All right. So if there are questions about what I did here, then I'm going to go back to the slides for a few minutes and uh, 
Okay, so uh, this we did already. The assumption, of course, was that MZ is approximately M naught. It seems like a wild assumption to make. It turns out, I think I took the slide out, but it turns out that uh, we're used to thinking of small tip angles or small angle approximations in geometry, and that means that the angle is a couple degrees, right? Sine of alpha equals alpha to alpha less than a few degrees. Um, it turns out that this approximation, this Fourier transform approximation, actually for the solution that I just showed you, actually works really well even for much larger flip angles. Meaning that you can, uh, you can uh, predict what the slice profile will be like just using the Fourier transform of that U1 envelope function, even when the flip angle is like 30 or 60 degrees. And in fact, even when it gets up to 90, the deviation is not as terrible as you might expect. So it's, it's a remarkably useful uh, thing to be able to use. That was just the solution itself. Um, so what did we do? Well, we said the excitation profile within the small tip angle approximation is just the Fourier transform of the pulse. So that gives us this easy kind of mapping, if you, if you will. Um, and you need to remember, of course, that the block equations are nonlinear, so they can't expect be expected to behave linearly. Uh, the approximation works surprisingly well, even up to flip angles as large as 90 degrees, which sounds crazy, because how you're, you're certainly not keeping MZ constant anymore with such large flip angles, but it's still a pretty good design strategy. Um, I talked about this a little bit already. In MR, obviously, we want pulses that are to be as short as possible, uh, in part to avoid relaxation effects. We usually ignore relaxation during excitation because it's short. Uh, and of course, we want short product pulses because uh, that'll help the overall uh, sequence efficiency or scan efficiency. Uh, the sync function, we already really talked about this, is defined over all time, which is practical for any experiment. And so the sync function needs to be truncated to be useful. And so here's an example of a truncated RF sync pulse. This is the pulse envelope function. It has just a handful of wiggles in it. The Fourier transform of that truncated RF pulse gives you the following slice profile. And uh, given a particular uh, applied gradient and uh, uh, applied gradient, this pulse will have a particular uh, bandwidth, and so we'll have a target slice thickness. So if the target slice thickness is represented by these two uh, dashed lines, uh, what's shown in the sort of wiggling white line is what the actual slice profile is. And what, is it, what it means is that within the boundaries of the slice you wanted, the two dashed lines, you'll have some oscillations. And that just means you're not getting the same amount of excitation from, from all sort of layers of your slice, if you will. That might be a minor effect. Maybe you don't care too much about this. But it also shows you that outside of your slice, outside of these dashed lines, there's some magnetization that's excited, and, and you will be inherently receiving that into your coil and sort of, um, uh, sort of just melting that into the rest of the slice information. You can't distinguish uh, the stuff that you actually wanted from everything that you actually will end up getting. So truncated RF pulses will have so-called truncation artifacts. There's ways to deal with it. There are ways to certainly improve it, but it's not going to be perfect under uh, sort of any sort. Um, the last thing we'll talk about quickly uh, is this, this last part of slice selection, right? So we said there was really three components, an RF pulse in combination with a gradient, that's two. And the third thing was this post-excitation refocusing. And so we have this term that hung out in front the whole time that I said it was related to, uh, or told us about the phase distribution through the thickness of the slice. So at the top of your slice, the spins are pointing this direction. As I go through the thickness of my slice, my spins are pointing in different directions. And so within a pixel, which is part of that slice, I'll have intravoxel dephasing, and that causes signal loss. So I'd like to undo that. Um, this dependency, though, uh, we know exactly what form it's going to take. Uh, and so that frequency-dependent phase shift from the gradients can be, uh, can be uh, easily undone. All we have to do is multiply by an exponential term that will offset this. This term here is, was just had a spatial dependence because of the gradients, and so we introduce a gradient of opposite polarity to undo those phase effects when we're done with excitation. And so that's why it's post-excitation uh, refocusing. It brings the spins back into alignment. Um, and so how do we actually uh, uh, do that? Well, we'll apply, like I said, a gradient with the opposite polarity at the very end here, and this will be able, this will undo uh, that phase twist through the slice after we're done with excitation. <coughs> um, and as you saw in the previous slice, at least, 
that refocusing gradient only needs to be half the duration uh, if the amplitude is the same. So if we continue, um, if we continue with the gradient amplitude that's equal but opposite, uh, it's what matters is the area. It's this area of that gradient waveform that's contributing to that uh, slice, uh, through slice dephasing. And so we just need to have a gradient of equal and opposite area after it. And it turns out, since it's only area that matters, there's different ways to shape that, uh, that uh, gradient area, right? So we know that we need the integral of the, uh, of the rephasing gradient to be equal to half of the integral of the slice select gradient. Um, and what's more important, what's most important is just the area of the gradient is half, meaning we can have shorter refocusing times if we make the refocusing gradient even stronger. And so uh, these two examples would be equivalent. We've got a truncated RF pulse in combination with the gradient. This gradient area here is equal to half the gradient of the slice select and will give us perfect refocusing, if you will. But that's not the most time efficient thing to do. All we need to do is get the right gradient area back. And we can do that with a gradient that's, say, three, four, or five times stronger, uh, and consequently three or four, five times shorter in duration. So if this has the same area, we will get back that slice select refocusing from the slice. And that's the most time efficient thing to do. So that's why you choose to do it. So let's look one more time um, at the animation I showed sort of maybe uh, 10, 15 minutes into the, into the first lecture and, and sort of pull together the pieces for the slice left of excitation. So combination of a gradient and an RF pulse, you'll see that there are some spins being excited, but there's a slice profile, right? All of those, slight, all those spins are tipped exactly the same amount. And in fact, they also end up with phase all over the place. We can undo some of that phase through the application of that refocusing gradient, and everything comes right back into focus. And it's going to give us the most signal from that excited slice. Okay, uh, that wraps up uh, the material I wanted to cover today. Happy to take questions for a little bit, and then the next thing we do is get you back to the questions.